Good afternoon. Welcome to our latest Hump Day Hangout. I'm Steve Pegram, the president of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, and I'm here with my co-host Aaron Heller, and uh, we're here to talk about training. It's the first Wednesday of the month, Hump Day Hangout, and uh, if you were with us last month, we kind of got off topic a little bit and started going down the road of having a lot of discussion about RIT and how RIT training is done and RIT response. So Aaron and I felt it was appropriate to get back on that topic this month. And uh, we're going to go there in just a minute, and Aaron will introduce uh, our guest with us today as well. First, I just want to mention that uh, if you have a question for the group, feel free to send it to hashtag FETalk on Twitter. That's hashtag FETalk on Twitter. And uh, behind the scenes, they will make sure that question gets out to us. Uh, as we know, FDIC, uh, for those of you who are uh, put in to be instructors for FDIC, those letters went out last week. Uh, several hundred really happy people and I know there were some people that were a little discouraged over 900 people applied to teach at FDIC 2016 uh, and they only accept about 200 220 um, so even people like the president of ISFSI get turned down once in a while uh, but I encourage people to uh, check out what's coming up at FDIC 2016 and if you're an instructor and you're looking to teach in the future and you might be one of those people that got turned down uh, the best advice I have for you is to uh, get involved in, in an article. If you have an article idea or you want to write an article about the class that you put in for, uh, if you write an article, if you submit some stuff on the blogs and things like that, they get to know you and they know your topic, much more likely to uh, get pushed to the top of the list at FDIC 2016 or 2017. So just want to throw that out there. Also, from the Instructor Society standpoint, um, we did release a set of videos yesterday. They are absolutely free based on the SLICE RS concept, uh, the Principles of Modern Fire Attack program, which is a program that was funded by the Assistance to Firefighters Act uh, Fire Prevention, Safety, and Research Grant. And those videos are now up on isfsi.org's website, Fire Engineering's website, and YouTube. And it's a four-video vi set, completely free, building on the SLICE RS concept and breaking down specific parts of that uh, concept. Again. It's a tool. It's something you might use in your training toolbox. It may be something you decide not to do, but I would encourage you to watch the videos, look at it, and see if there's any adjustments or changes you want to make to your organization, specifically your training. And then finally, the International Society of Fire Service Instructors have an instructor development conference uh, October 14th through the 17th, Knoxville, Tennessee. Again, isfsi.org for information on that conference and Penwell Fire Engineering is one of our sponsors of that event this year and we want to thank you or thank them once again for that. So without further ado, we'll get into our topic today and I'll let my co-host Aaron Heller take it from here. All right, thanks Steve, I appreciate it. Uh, so here we are again this, this month, uh, another very important topic. My name is Aaron Heller, I'm a captain in Hamilton Township, New Jersey uh, in Mercer County. I, I served as a volunteer chief in a little town called New Egypt for many years and uh, was part of their leadership for about 25 years and uh, so I've, I've been blessed to be on both sides of the aisle and, and uh, have operated a training company for many years so I, I've seen a lot of sides of, of the picture. Um, luckily with us today is, is truly one of the guys who in my career has been not only a mentor but I, I think a, a, real, a real motivating force in the fire service. Uh, I met Dave Gallagher in probably 1996 or 97, I don't know, my first year at FDIC, um, and, and you know, we, we uh, hit it off right away. I, I took a bunch of his classes and learned a lot from him, and uh, some of the most truck work that I've ever learned came from a guy, a lieutenant who just not too many years ago retired out of Huber Heights, Ohio after many, many years on the job there. Uh, Dave also works now for the Mass Fire Academy up in Massachusetts uh, and teaches a whole bunch of RIT programs around Massachusetts. So I think that he is one of the most fitting uh, guests that we could have on, on the show today. And, and just a, a little plug for Dave is when my department, which is very, very heavily involved in rapid intervention in the county, uh, when we want to freshen up our skills and we really want to test our personnel, uh, we brought Dave and a few of his guys, a few guys that he taught with in to one of our acquires and worked with us for a weekend because we just felt we wanted some of the best to train with us and, and really really see where we were and gauge our level of abilities and, and capabilities. 
and Dave was the first person we thought of. So uh, welcome aboard, Dave. Appreciate you being here, and uh, we'll get right into it. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate the, uh, the kind words. Uh, I think one of the things that I would like to say is I've been involved in a couple of rapid intervention situations before we even knew what RIP was, and there's a lot of departments and a lot of people out there that took their issues, their uh, incidents, if you will, if, you know, even going back to Phoenix, Worcester, et cetera, and started sharing it with the fire service, and then we watched some of the motivated people take it and go. And I think we've all learned, you know, from the John Salkas, Butch Cobb, Jimmy Crawfords, and, uh, and kept this going. And I know it's been back and forth, refined, etc. So uh, I'm looking very much forward to today's discussion. Excellent. And and you know, before we get to the end and we run out of time, and I forgot to do it, uh, one thing to think of is this is the September edition of the Hump Day Hangout, and we're talking training. And I think we'd be really remiss if we didn't, you know, just throw out there that here we are coming up on the on the 14th anniversary of of September 11th attacks and uh, and just you know take that moment in your own heads to to say a prayer or think about the brothers we've lost and and the effects that it's had over the course of time. I mean, uh, there's there's nothing like it. There's there's no way to describe it. You know, far better people than I have tried. Um, so today I, I tell you, I usually wear a nice collared shirt on these things, but I couldn't find one that I wanted. So today I put on one of my uh, Dana Hannon Memorial t-shirts because uh, you know I want to remember Dana on, on a special day as always uh, Dana was an FDIC instructor and, and a great friend to us and uh, a big part of our world so uh, as, as were all the guys that were lost that day but uh, so anyway let's get into it uh, Steve you got the first question or where are we well, going? I think just a little bit of background for those that might not have been with us last month is we we, uh, we were talking a little bit about training and how we train with um, you know, a lot of places now are doing more and more mutual aid and automatic mutual aid where I may have control over the training in Goshen, Ohio as the fire chief, but I don't have any control over the training of my seven mutual aid partners. And um, when we get dispatched on a structure fire, we're responding with three or four of those agencies, and we just make an assumption that their training is going to mimic what our training is. And, and that's sort of where we got off topic and started getting into the RIT discussion last time. Um, but really where I wanted to go a little bit with it from, from a fire chief standpoint is, you know, I'm hearing more and more people, you know, that was real hot and heavy RIT for a while. And then like a lot of things in the fire service, the buzzword lost some of its uh, popularity and people started going down other roads of, of what the new hot button topic is. But I think it's still very important but I'm not sure we're all looking at RIT in the same manner. And before we came on the air, you know, uh, one of the Penwell people who's not a fire service person was asking us what RIT even stood for and, you know, rapid intervention team and what they did. And in some places, it's the traditional, they stage a bunch of tools on the front yard and they stand by for a Mayday incident to occur. In other places, um, they have companies that are assigned and are, uh, doing much more what I would call aggressive or proactive things, removing obstacles, safing, making the building more safe and looking out for hazards. And in other places, they're really getting away from RIT altogether and focusing their training on uh, the basics and teaching every firefighter to know what to do in a Mayday situation because statistically we're hearing that a lot of Mayday, uh, when Mayday incidents are occurring, the firefighters are not being rescued by the RIT team, but they're being rescued by the firefighter sitting that's standing next to them or the crew that's operating in the next room. So I just threw out about five different topics there, but I wanted to get your guys because the two of you spend a lot more time on the road teaching tactics than I do. And, you know, maybe you could give us some perspective of what you're seeing out there, where the focus is and where you think the focus should be when we're training our personnel on RIT. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to jump in on that, Steve. I think you make some incredibly excellent and valid points. I think one of the first things, and I've been very fortunate, and I'll put a, a plug in for the Mass Fire Academy, they've approached it, uh, Jack Beckwith and Sean White have, have approached this in a particular way. And for a long time, back when I had first met Aaron, et cetera, uh, before I was associated with the Mass Academy, it seems that when we go out, we're seeing a lot of 
the saving our own, the firefighter safety and survival skills are being translated as rapid intervention. So they feel they're comfortable with certain aspects of wall breaching, low profiling, uh, you know, any number of things, the ladder bales, the rope bales, that qualifies as RIT. One of the things that, again, I've been fortunate to learn through some incredibly talented people that are very motivated, I think these are some significantly separate areas. Uh, the, you know, back in the Stone Age when I went through, you didn't even declare a mayday. We didn't know how it was never discussed, and it has since evolved. But if we're looking at how we do this, we've even seen probies, uh, call departments, career departments, people with not even three months on the job suddenly thrust into a rapid intervention team class where there are some high-end skills to be done. And I don't know that's the most appropriate uh, use of time for them. They don't even have their own skills down. SCBA familiarization, for example, how do they solve their own issues if they get jammed up? I think that when we start distilling this out a little bit, and it may be semantics, but if we concentrate on firefighter survival, or even going back to the tactics of how not to get in trouble in the first place, but then we go into firefighter survival. How do we breach a wall? How do we low profile? Skills that are within ourselves and our problem solving issues that are in our own pockets, then after we have a good handle on that, then move them into rapid intervention. Because as we all well know, rapid intervention could be anything, for example, there in, what was it, Scranton, uh, just recently. You had firefighters lost in a structure, and all they needed to do was have somebody to direct them out. There again, you have people who have been involved in a collapse. They're trapped, they're pinned, they're burned, they're injured. That's a whole different set of skills. But I think in a, and perhaps it's just out of convenience, uh, the broad brush for RIT has encompassed a lot, and I think we may need to be a little bit more definitive on what we are expecting our people to be capable of. Uh, your example, or you know what your department's capable of, but you have no idea next door what they've done, what they've looked at. Their RIT training may have been what the rest of us would call survival. Suddenly you need somebody extracted from a basement or a second floor and they just don't have the skill set to do that. Not because they don't want to, it's just not been the area in which they've trained. And I think that's, that's a big part of it at this point in time, is figuring out what we need to do and how we need to do it, and breaking that down a little bit into more specific areas, if you will. I, I think that makes complete sense. And I've seen the same thing. Um, we've done a lot of RIT training in the region, and. Uh, uh, myself and Billy Hobson and, and actually the chief that I work for, Anizeski, in, in Hamilton, uh, and several other Jersey guys sat down, God, it's, it's probably been 10 years now, and wrote the, the training curriculum that we, we wanted to see New Jersey adopt. And um, it was interesting because we had representatives throughout the country, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, for throughout the state, who had taken training throughout the country, and we all came together and, and tried to develop this. We didn't rewrite, you know, we didn't reinvent the wheel, um, but it was difficult to get that done, and at a state level, it was very difficult, and the, the guideline got put there, whether it's followed, whether it's not, and it's typical New Jersey, it has no teeth, uh, because, you know, state mandates, state pay, so we know how that works, um, but, but these are the things that we tried to address almost 10 years ago, and, and here we are 10 years later, and we're still talking about the same things. How do we how do we kind of chop that out? And I don't I, I think as Dave said originally we had separate programs. You know you had the the Lasky Salka Illinois Fire Service Institute those groups who did saving our own and who also did firefighter safety and survivals. Um, Jimmy Jimmy McCormick's guys out in Indiana same thing very delineated it was very laid out and now we. I wouldn't say we've bastardized it, but we've certainly married them awfully close to the point where maybe the lines are very blurred. And and I think you're right. I think we do have to kind of cut that down a little bit again. Um, and to, to go further on that, the one thing that I've seen in our area is we have designated rapid intervention companies. And the problem with that is, as you said and as Steve said, 
that rescue may need to be made by the guy next to you at that moment because the RIP team may not be there yet. The last one we had here in Hamilton, a captain was was uh, got off the line. A, bit, a lot of things went wrong and not his fault at all. Just a lot of breakdowns and a lot of things. And thank God we're not an IOSH report because of it. But what we found was that the writ was still coming down the road when this when he hit the mayday. They weren't on scene yet. Now we can't just sit and wait for them to get there. So really, it's the responsibility of every company to be trained in firefighter rescue to some degree. And I don't see that right now. I, I see I see guys saying we only have ten people in our whole volunteer firehouse, or we only have three guys on duty at a time. Well, we can't be a writ. We can't offer this service to others. It ain't about offering the service to others so much as it is offering that service to the brother that goes down next to you. Yeah. You know? That, that's I, a good agree. point. And here, here locally, and I know we mentioned it a little bit before, but when, uh, when organizations go through some type of mayday situation or have a firefighter down scenario and they share that information like Dave talked about, it, it's great for us because we can learn from that experience because not all of us have that experience in our, you know, slide, in our slide tray. Here locally in Southwest Ohio, unfortunately, we had several line of duty deaths a few years ago, and Cincinnati Fire Department took that approach and shared all the information from their line of duty death of Oscar Armstrong, and they went into heavily into retraining their entire organization in into RIT and um, and that sort of thing. But one of the things that they, when they were out teaching the suburban departments and telling everybody was. They were finding, I, I believe when they first started the program, their thir they started dispatching a third truck. And so the mm -hmm. third new truck was the RIT company. And what they were finding is their maydays were occurring before they even arrived on the fire ground. And they were putting all their emphasis and all their you know, hopes and dreams of a firefighter rescue scenario on that third new truck. And the incident was occurring before they got there. And so some adjustments were made in run cards and, and who gets assigned what duties, but they also went back and retrained and trained the entire department on the rapid intervention uh, duties, not just the truck companies, which is where they started out. And I think that gets back to what I think the three of us probably would agree on, is it's not a basic skill. It's not what you learn in Firefighter 1 and 2, but it's probably a skill that every firefighter needs, exactly like Aaron said, not so we can run more mutual aid to other departments, but so we can rescue a firefighter from our own department when he's on the nozzle and he falls through the floor two feet in front of us. Oh, you're absolutely right, Steve. I, and the validations for that keep coming. If you look at the uh, Beacon Street Back Bay Fire in Boston, where Lieutenant Walsh and Firefighter Kennedy were lost, rapid intervention was just pulling up. And you look at a metro department where, and you know, what's their response times? Two or three minutes, even for the third do, up maybe five minutes, where some of us, you know, where is your third do company coming from? How far away? Are they 12 minutes out? Yep. That's not the crew to keep depending upon for rapid intervention as far as, you know, that initial uh, incident. I, if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say um, Butchie Cobb and Jimmy Crawford in their classes had even mentioned the maydays occur within the first eight minutes of arrival, the, the gross majority of them, if, if we can agree on that. That's not second and third due companies. That's the the teams that are operating right then and right there. And I would agree with you tremendously. You know, get them through Firefighter 1 and 2, get them comfortable with their stuff, and now maybe it's time for that, uh, that other line of training, if you will, to come in. You know, we get them trained on hazmat. We get them trained on auto X. We get them trained on that. And that goes back to the, uh, what is it, the... Uh, High frequency, low risk, and low frequency, high risk scenarios. What's really going to make the difference here? What's going to cause the issue? Uh, I know in the two I was personally involved with, it was us. You, you know, the first time we couldn't even spell it. We had no clue what it was. The second one, it was all the people that were directly involved in close proximity. And as Aaron pointed out as well, the stuff that's showing up on Facebook and YouTube, the helmet cams, and guys standing there, somebody goes through the floor right next to them. That's your, your operation. I don't know, and one of the things I've been rolling over and rolling over and rolling over, I think what is a misnomer is the rapid part. 
<laughs> I think they expect the thing to be solved rapidly. And mm -hmm. I think we've done ourselves um, a misjustice, uh, you know, perhaps the uh, bastardization. I, one of the things I've been trying to do is, is to relate to people about this, especially in this day and age and upcoming firefighters, is, you know, what's the quick reaction force for the military? It doesn't solve the problem quick, but it gets mobilized, gets equipped, gets there quickly. It doesn't necessarily solve the issue quickly, but it's that ace in the hole. It's that backup team that's coming in. So that's one of the ways that I've been looking at it, is RIP is more of that uh, quick reaction force type of thing to go in if the initial companies get jammed up. To that end, one of the things we've seen and uh, I've been very, very impressed with the way Massachusetts has been dealing with it is their idea of the RIT, you know, the, the multiple RIT system in that RIT 1 could be the people right there. Can they make a difference? Do they know where the down member is? Is there some way they can assist them? Mm -hmm. You know, they declare the mayday because if you figure you've already been working for a little bit, you'd be seven, eight minutes into the incident. What's your air supply now? What's your, your physical ability at this point? And do you have people to continue to fight the fire? Uh, so we're looking at training a multi-pronged approach. Next team comes in, puts the down individual on air. That may take them eight or ten minutes just to get to the person, get them on air, get a harness converted, then try to get another team to get them out. Now, that being said, not everybody has that luxury. So do we look at rotating out, et cetera? Uh, you know, maybe that first team is now going to be the third team. Maybe you need the exterior leaning ladder to get somebody out or the basement evolutions. At what point in time do we train our departments in a realistic fashion to address that instead of saying, oh, okay, you know, you're what one, that's great, you're with two. The, the call departments, the, the suburban departments that have five people a shift, eight people a shift, is this their reality? And I think to the point, you know, you and Steve have both made, we have to start training with our reality, not somebody else's, and not a, this concept of, oh, we've got a dozen people to throw. We may have to recycle six people, you know, in teams of two or something just to get this done. Recently I was talking to a, uh, an FDNY member about some of the line of duties back in the day, and the you know the ones that were in the basement just getting them five feet across the basement to the step took everything they had now how and they've got how many people on arrival they you know the extra writ companies it's 60 people the three of us are tripping over each other how do we deal with that with the six member or eight member or three member response what is that reality how do we train to accommodate that is something I think we really need to figure out you said two things there, Dave, I wanted to hit on. One is rapid intervention isn't very rapid. And uh, I Googled that real quick while you said it because I've heard that before. In 2003, the Phoenix Fire Department, several chiefs wrote an article called Rapid Intervention Isn't Very Rapid based upon their findings of the Brent Tarver line of duty death Absolutely. in a supermarket fire where it took dozens of firefighters, more than 20 minutes, I believe, to carry one firefighter out of a building. And, uh, you know, he, it wasn't that he was trapped. It wasn't that they were, you know, it was just maneuvering a six-foot-six firefighter in bunker gear, soaking wet on air through a grocery store and, you know, over uh, debris and over hose lines and everything else. And there was this, uh, we all thought rapid intervention was rapid. And I think that was the first wake-up call we got that, you know, it really isn't. But, again, that was 2003. So that's you know, if my math's correct, 13 years ago, and we're still calling it rapid intervention. And I think we all know what that means, but I think it's a great point that it's not so as rapid as we think it is, which leads me to the next thing you said, is people need to start training how they operate. And if you, if you know you only have five people, you need to train for operating with five people. But if you know you only have five people, there's another option too, and that is to be looking at and thinking about, and this is where I get on my soapbox, your staffing, your automatic aid, your mutual aid, whatever system you have, because I think we can all nod our head and agree that, you know, five people on an initial dispatch of a residential house fire is not enough. 
and, and you were sharing with us before we came online, you know, some dispatching errors um, out of fire yesterday in southwest or southern Ohio, um, where because of dispatching errors, a bunch of companies got on scene were operating with less than what they were used to. But again, in communities where, you know, five people is the normal daytime response, it's predictable, it's preventable, as Gordon Graham says. We know that today. So we should be changing our operations based upon that today rather than waiting until we have a May Day event, a NIOSH report, and then start talking about the lessons learned and, and creating that change. Well, it, and validating exactly what you said at the, at the lead with, with Goshen and where you are. How do we know, and, and this is where it, the reality ties in for me, if we know we have five or six on duty, you know, and we have an ALS unit and it's at the hospital and then you get the fire, how are we inviting these other departments to come in and train, uh, get on the same page, get on the same radio traffic, get on the same terminology? Uh, recently, I uh, was down in Pennsylvania doing a rapid intervention class and we asked the, the host company, because there were five departments that showed up, they all worked together. They couldn't even talk on the radio together. You know, so how, and this goes exactly to your point, Chief, is this is the kind of barriers that have to be broken down both, you know, at all levels of the operation. We've got to know that any one of those five departments that you run with, that, that everybody else is dependent upon, are we trained to the same level? Do we have the same terminology? Um, a, an anecdote as an example, one I use uh, where I worked, we were on the county line, department in the next county right next door that we ran with frequently. Their county decided to use the acronym FAST. We were using RIT. One evening they had a fire. Uh, I believe it was a situation where you only started getting RIT or FAST if a working fire was declared. They got busy. It was a working fire. It wasn't declared. So, you know, the chief, it, 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 the, that domino didn't fall. So he calls... Uh, and says, you know, I need uh, Huber Heights for a fast truck, fast truck. Their dispatcher calls our dispatcher and says, you know, we need a fast truck. And our dispatcher called the battalion chief and said, what's the fastest truck we have? We didn't bring the dispatchers into it either. And he's like, what are you talking about? Oh, well, you know, they want a fast truck. What's the fastest truck we got? And that's even another layer of learning how this has to play out. What exactly do we need? Where are we going to get it? And to go back to your original point, you've got five departments around you. How do we know we can be interoperable and get that done? Absolutely. Aaron? Uh, yeah, and, and I agree with you. It, it, it starts with pre-planning like everything else does. It, it starts with at the top, and, and maybe sometimes the tail wags a dog, and the guys from, that are on the line start saying, hey, we need, to, we need to work on these things to get to where we need to be. And I, and as always, maybe I'm quite jaded being a company officer for the last God knows how many years now, but I believe it starts at the center of the, of the pyramid. I believe it starts with the company officer. I think it's important and it's imperative that a company officer be able to look at a crew and understand what they are capable of doing today. If I look at my three guys on the rig with me, are we capable of, number one, calling the mayday? Are we capable of packaging one of our downed guys, one of our own, while we're waiting for the you know, for the for the guys in the white hats to come to the come to the rescue. Are we capable of getting somebody into a room where we can shelter them until until we get them to a safer location? And, and you know, we talk about the key skills. Okay, so what are those key skills that we need to function as a RIT? First we need the key skills as being firemen. That and and that's kind of a key. I mean can you stretch a line? Can you operate? Can you protect the down crew? You know, if I'm on the engine company and a guy in the truck is, is on the floor above and goes down, I damn sure better be able to protect the, the staircase, or I better be able to, to get the line in between the victim and the, and the fire. So those are the basic skills that we should have had before we put them in a jump seat. doesn't always happen, or sometimes those skills get a little tarnished and need polish. So, but the RIT skills themselves, you know, can we, can we convert a harness with fire gloves on? Can we, uh, you know... Do we understand how the UAC works? Do we understand, you know, the components of their air pack? Uh, we've made it easier now that now that air packs are supposed to be uh, uh, 
user friendly as far as whether you, it doesn't matter what brand you're using, but your connection should be the same and, and, and so forth, even though there's deviations. So I think you're, I think that's a big question. What skills do the individual firefighters need? And maybe these are skills that we should teach them in pro school because we've still got them. And when we get them into the 1002 section of it, maybe, maybe this is time to introduce them to some of these things. Uh, you know, and then, and then there's a whole wider variety of once we've got them trained, how we assign them. And we talked about the, uh, the number of staffing we have. Where I work, the first due companies, we're going to have, if it's a one-on-one -on -one response for a fire alarm, we're only going to have seven to eight personnel. Uh, if it comes in as a working job, we have 15 to 18 personnel, depending on what it is. Is that writ proactive, or is that writ lawn shepherds? You know, do they throw ladders? Do they force entry? You know, that's a whole other, heck, we could talk slicers versus versus traditional fire attack, and or fog versus uh, smoothbore, and it's the same thing of talking proactive writ versus stand on the front yard writ. So, you know, these are all things that maybe I just created a bunch more questions, but these are things we need to address. Company officers need to address first, and, and that, I believe, and then it needs to go up the line. One of the things I've, I've tried to promote when I've been talking to people is grab the NIOSH reports, and in my opinion, our line of duty death reports are training skill sheets. Uh, if I, you know, one Meridian Plaza in Philadelphia was not applicable in my operation. However, uh, recently when the young firefighter was killed on the front porch in Pennsylvania, that is applicable to my operation. So taking that company officer, researching, hey, could we solve this? You know, the Contra Costa fire out in California. You're, I mean, how big was this house? 900 square feet? If we can't get people out of there, how do we get people out of the, um, the, the McMansions and stuff that are out there? But going back to your skill sets, the firematic skill sets, the laddering, the hose movement, see what we need. What are we looking at? Can we move a firefighter upstairs, downstairs? What are the skill sets that we do have to be proficient, with which we have to be proficient? And just going back a bit to the whole... Uh, the whole rapid part of that. Also, when do we understand that we are going from a firefighter down rescue incident to a technical rescue incident? I think that is another place we need to really examine where that, that line exists. You still have departments that are doing, like Steve was saying, you know, from how many years ago did we have the Brett Tarver incident? What happened? Now everybody, you strip the truck, throw it all in the Stokes basket, you put it in the front yard, and we only have three in the company. You couldn't even lift the Stokes basket for crying out loud. What is practical? What is applicable? You know, do we move as a as a light force? Do we move as a heavy group? How can we even operate? You know, what what's the key number here? Uh, and that depends on these people's reality. You know, whether you learn the Chicago way, the Pittsburgh way, the New York way, or, or the Jersey City way. There are all nuances of difference in there based upon where they were from and what worked for them. So taking, you know, the Huber Heights, Ohio, the, the New Egypt, New Jersey, the Goshens, et cetera, what is our reality? And I think if we step back to the two and a half story balloon frame with the fire flight of caught in the attic space, excuse me, or in the back stairs or in the basement, that's what we need to be capable of. If they're on the front room floor and the kitchen floor on the tile and they're within six feet of the back door, I think we all know, you know what's going to be going on there. But do we have that skill set to convert that harness, to get that writ pack on them? And can they even recognize when this sort of thing needs to be used and taking the time to uh, get it set? Ropes, knots, uh, all that. But we're not doing heavy rigging. We need something applicable and quick that they learned in Firefighter 1 and 2. You know, does this clovage come in here? Great. You know, what, uh, what do I need to do with the air pack? And those types of familiarizations. I think the not only at the level of the firefighter that is on the team, but the team leader understanding the strategy and tactics, even you know thermal imaging capabilities. Do have they had that opportunity? 
to know this stuff. I think there's so many parts of the menu here that has to make the recipe come out. Uh, you can vary things. You know, you may like something sweeter or less sweet, but it's still going to be iced tea. So where do we... I think we have to work backwards into what our reality is as far as that training goes as to developing the the pertinent, shall I say, skill sets to your jurisdiction and your response. We are we are saying a whole bunch of mouthfuls at one time when it comes into this, and, and I know that we can, we can carry this conversation on for month after month. Um, and and I, I agree. I think that it, it has to be where we dial in our capabilities and what our response to this is going to be. Um, again, we've looked at that big picture is where they're at, we're coming in, we have all this equipment. As you said, are we a heavy force or a light force? That's a really good way of putting it. Uh, where I work, we've, we've staffed the rig with four. We never go below four. Um, I will always thank the chief and the commissioners for allowing us to have that staffing. It's, it's, it saves lives. There's no doubt in my mind it makes us a better force. But I know every time I pull up, I've got four. Now, in, in the middle of the night, in a small town in, in, you know, central Texas, do they have that? Do they have that, you know, in, in somewhere in the middle of the bayou in Louisiana where we've taught? It, it's not the same. So we've got to identify that. Each company has to identify what they're going to have and what capabilities they have. And when we decide that we're going to commit firefighters to the inside of a burning building or into a hazard zone where they could be caught in a collapse, it doesn't, you know, you could be doing this from, from the windows or the door when things go badly. Not nearly as, as, as difficult a rescue probably, but still, each company is going to have to figure out what they can do and how they can do it. And, and that's the problem with a lot of the articles and a lot of the, the canned programs from state organizations and county organizations and everybody else is we try to encompass what most of us would do as opposed to you can't narrow it down sometimes to what New Egypt does, what Hamilton does, what Goshen does and that's where the big programs lack versus what we should do on a local basis if that but makes any sense. Some of the skill sets you know as we've been talking about on the personal level, air management, just your own stuff, being able to handle that, being in shape. Not everybody's going to be successful being on the rapid intervention team. Uh, but, you know, I go back to ropes and knots, tool manipulation, tool familiarity. Are, you know, do we realize that a 10-foot folding attic ladder makes one really great prying tool to lift up a collapse, and it also makes a, a pretty slick, you know, stretcher, so to speak. Um, and are we familiar with those types of things? Can a, a RIP member that's going in to rescue another firefighter, are they comfortable with low profile to get through that tiny void space they may have to get to just to even get air on the individual? And not only their air pack, but being able to apply air to somebody else uh, in, that, in that situation. Are they familiar? One of the, one of the drills Mass Academy does is we have the uh, attendees stand up, close their eyes, we go through parts of the air pack and just say, raise your right hand, raise your left hand, depending on which side it's on. And I would say uh, it's a good day of 50% get all of our questions correct. You know, just even to the point of, you know, where is your pass reset button? Are they set with those skills to learn how the things they have to work with every day and perhaps apply or deal with on a down member. Does that work well? I think another thing we've really gotten away from is ropes and knots. There's times, you know, a clove hitch somewhere or a figure eight on a bike is going to make all the difference in the world in getting an evolution done. But I think those are some incredible skill sets that uh, a, a member should, should need to have. No doubt. Uh and, and here again, we go back to the basics. And, and, and I think every month when we start talking about a topic, we always end up going back and saying, 
Do they have the ability? Do they have the staffing? Do they have the training? And of course, we're talking the training, so we have to provide it. Um, but that's that's the foundation for everything we do in this job. And and rapid intervention, I like that you googled the, the rapid intervention is in rapid because that stuck in my head as soon as as soon as Dave said it. I remember reading the articles about it, and I remember, remember and I remember the testing. And and I was fortunate enough many years ago. My department sent me to. Uh, Jimmy McCormick's uh, fire department training network out in Indianapolis. Again, this is years ago, uh, and I met some fine firemen who today we took the class together. Brian Arnold, who's an FDIC instructor and, and uh, you know a boss in Oklahoma City, he and I were in a class together. That's where we met at that academy, and we were both written instructors for our departments. But we knew that we needed to get more education. We needed to learn more about it. And our department saw fit to send us to a place like that with very, just fantastic instructors. And, and they're still running those programs. And they've upgraded them and they've made them better. In Illinois, you know, I remember taking a class where, where I watched Bobby Hoff teach rapid intervention. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm not nearly this good. How do I get to this level? And these are the things that today's firefighters have to do because the training's out there. And it's not necessarily just local training. You know, you have to you have to get out and you have to search it. Um, and and again, I guess we get back to that. Uh, don't just go to the Facebook fireman's web page or blog site and think, oh man, that's the, he's the answer. Uh, so you know, uh, one of the one of the questions that comes up is um, who, what, what do you recommend? And I'm not here to to sell anybody's anything, not mine, nor you know Jimmy McCormick's or the Illinois Fire Service Institute or what we do here in Jersey or the Mass Fire Academy. Uh, there's some there's some great stuff out there. Uh, one of the questions was what what books, what resources, uh, you know, anything. I would honest to God, I would go back and I would look up in the archives any article that Butch Cobb wrote way back when. Butch was. Butch, I'm getting there. <laughs> Butch was a chief in, in Jersey City who really was one of the fathers of this. And, and I remember taking a class of his when I was probably 25 years old, if that. Um, any teachings and any writings that Jimmy Crawford. I asked Jim Crawford to be on here as a guest with us today. Uh, and and uh, Jim, is, Jim is a guru of rapid intervention, in my opinion. Uh, he was involved in staff meetings at this point, so he couldn't, couldn't make it with us. But uh, I thought he and Dave would be the perfect two to bounce off the stuff. Oh, no, um, I learned a lot of my stuff from him. He's, <laughs> uh, and, and some of the other stuff that's out there, uh, there's a great RICO program out in Illinois that, that the guys run. Uh, and it's, it's a privately run program. It's offered all over. They do a tremendous job. Uh, some of our good friends, uh, uh, D District Chief Kevin Maloney has taught in that program for years from Worcester. You know, I, I personally look for somebody who has done it and experienced it. You know, I've been fortunate in my life that I haven't, knock on wood, needed a writ, but I've been on several incidents where either the victim self-rescued or the writ was just getting there to, to do the work as things were, were coming about. Uh, so, yeah, there's, I guess those programs are fantastic. Obviously, you look at FDIC programs. I, I took some of my best writ training at FDIC. I hate to admit it, but it's over 20 years ago now. Um, so, you know, these are the things. Um, and, there, and there are some good tech book, textbooks out there that, that you probably should look at. Uh, you guys want to add to that? I, I think, and you hit it on the head, I think vetting the sources, finding out who's been there, who's done that. You know, you look at Hoff and Calumet. You look at the, the RICO yes. programs, Cobb, Crawford, uh, so many of those that have, and I and I think what impresses me about those programs as well, and that's where we all got our start. That's where we started learning about rapid intervention. I'll be blunt. Uh, when we had our one incident that was just an abject, uh, fortunately, <laughs> despite our best efforts, the person made it out fine, I like to say. <laughs> I said, this is never happening again because after that was over, I sat in the front yard, and I said, I thought I knew my stuff. And when you sit there and you go, I can never let this happen ever again. And I started searching and I started looking people up. And 
when you know we had the opportunity for the the old school, the Chicago guys, the Hawk brothers, and all that, uh, and Chief Salk and Mark McLeese and all those guys, and Sal Marquez yeah. was starting their programs. We took everything right. we could get our hands on because all of these individuals, the Butch Cobbs, the Jim Crawfords, all of these people had a firsthand story to tell that was very similar to what I experienced, experienced the helplessness, uh, the, the anger, the frustration, and they were not going to let it happen again. Uh, think about Mark Langbart. Think about Denver, Dave McGrail and all those guys. You know, How long did they work with that? How long did Buffalo work with that? How long did Columbus work with that after John Nance? So I think when you're looking, and I, I'm right in there with Aaron, the, the one-day Facebook wonders, that's not where you get your information. You need to find out where they got theirs, but you've got to go back to the roots of this. And what's impressed me about all of these legends in rapid intervention, they've adjusted their programs because after a while it was like, you know, we could do this better. Like I said, we started out dumping the truck. Now the first team goes in with a you know a tick, a set of irons, and a search line, and a, mm -hmm. and a rip pack just to find the victim. We're not taking ten people to get in there just to get them, get them on air, get the situation stabilized, get the fresh team in. Because if we start throwing people at this and you exhaust that first team in, and they start running low on air, we just exponentially you know, snap food everything. But I think going back to the people that are vetted, the uh, you know the, the fire engineering library, like Aaron said, the, the places that have the solid stuff, that is the place to start. Not everything is going to be applicable, uh, you know, and we found right. it. But that goes back to you know to what uh, what Steve was saying. What's good for Goshen? You know, what's what's good for what's good for Philadelphia may not be good for Huber Heights. So I think you have to distill that in the discussion you guys were having. Before this started, that broad brush thing, it doesn't work. You know, it's it's like calling the same play on, on every down in football or using the same club in golf. It doesn't work. Can't keep doing it that way. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, and, and you kind of hit on it a second ago. There was a blog post not too long ago. I think Chief Goldfeder uh, may have written it on the secret list, but it, essentially it was who's training your firefighters, and I know – Aaron and I hit that topic a few months ago, but again, here, here's another one of those areas where you want to take RIT training and you want to have RIT training from people that function on a RIT company or operate in that environment, or some of the best people are the people that have unfortunately had an incident, whether the incident went well or went poorly. They can share more information than any of us who have never had that slide in our slide tray, and, and I go back to you know, locally here in the Cincinnati metropolitan area, we didn't get serious about it until we had a line of duty death. And when Cincinnati Fire Department shared that information, the people that shared the information were the people that were on the fire ground that day. That were, you know, either they were hands-on at the incident, they were in a safety officer or incident commander role, uh, or they were part of the team that investigated the incident uh, post-incident analysis. And having those people sit there and show you the video, show you the slides, and talk about the, the real-life incident, um, which resulted in, in an unfortunate line-of-duty death, that's good training. And, and that validates the message that they're teaching you and, and what they're telling you much more than, like you said, just reading something that you find on the Internet and you really don't know where it's from. But also, as Dave pointed out, and Aaron and I have talked a lot of times, you got to be careful applying – you know, New York City or for Philadelphia or Chicago or L.A. strategy and tactics to Goshen, Ohio, because our staffing is different, our response is different, uh, when our companies arrive, in what order they arrive in, our water supply, everything we do is different. We're both fire departments, uh, and we both respond as a fire department, but our operations, our staffing and everything, and our training are vastly different, so we can't expect the same results just because we take a training class from somebody that it's going to work that way in our environment. You got to you got to package everything together and make sure you're you're assessing everything, not just what you learned in training this week. Absolutely. I, and I uh, one thing I still go back to is I would encourage company officers, training officers, chief officers, <clears throat> find the line of duty death reports, the NIOSH reports, 
use them as your next training. You know, okay, this structure is very similar to what we have here. You can discuss how you would get the member out. What would you do? Do you have the people? Do you have that capability? And I, I you know, your outline's already done. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can see it firsthand whether your department has the skill sets and everything you just said, Chief. You know, the 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 recipe to solve this problem, or at least give it the effort it deserves. Yeah, and and one more thing I just throw out there is, um, you know, we we know that this is an issue for us locally. When I say we, I'm talking Goshen, Ohio, and you know, we have some interesting challenges because we're rural suburban. You make a left out of the firehouse, you have hydrants, you make a right out of the firehouse. It's rural water supply. And, you know, it's advantageous to us that it's set up that way because we know if we're going left, hydrants, if we're going right, no hydrants. It makes it easier for us to make those tactical and strategic decisions. But it's hard for us to predict, you know, what's going to happen on a one-alarm fire because we have seven different one-alarm fire box alarms depending on where it is, what part of the township, you know, 36 square miles, we can be very rural one minute on a horse farm, and we can be very suburban urban uh, 15 minutes later. But going back to that, we've focused, we still talk about RIT, we still assign companies to do that, and um, but we, we assign those companies a little bit later on, probably a little bit later on than I want to, but we have trained and focused on putting water on the fire as quickly as possible try, in hopes to make to prevent the May Day from ever occurring. And I think, you know, everything we've talked about today uh, is important. And But again, going back to the staffing, if you realize that your staffing is inadequate uh, or you don't want to, you know, you don't want to say that out loud that our staffing is inadequate, if you think that you're responding with less firefighters than you would like to, if it was up to you, then you need to be adjusting your, your SOPs and your training for that, and, and at least I can speak for one fire department because it's the only place I'm fire chief at. In Goshen, you know, our focus is get quick water on the fire. And if we get quick water on the fire, I'm not going to have to worry about assigning the RIT companies because by the time the second or third engine's getting there, the fire's already out. Now, with that said, if we get there and have fire blowing out of multiple windows or on two floors or things like that, we're going extra companies, extra alarms because we know we're going to have to fill all those roles of fire attack, you know, backup line, a third line, ventilation, search and rescue, water supply, and RIT. You know, and that's when we're getting into those, those larger scale incidents. But again, you know, we've got to front load those incidents and have realistic tactical priorities on what we're going to do um, to eliminate the May Day as much as possible. Well said. That's what, and that's what solves the issue. You put the fire... <laughs> You know, the late great Andy Fredericks. Yeah, I just wrote that down. <laughs> Fire out, you don't have to jump out the windows. Right. The problems tend to go away when you when you put water on flames. And, and sometimes that's easier said than done. It sure. is. You know, is. I, I, bro I just broad brush the issue and say, we can put quick water on the fire. Well, sometimes you can't find the fire. Right. You know, well, and, and, and fires when you pull up and you've got smoke pouring out of everywhere, but you can't find the fire. So and, and you know back to the tactical training aspect of, of knowing your structure, knowing your camera, your response district, the things that yeah. you go to all the time, and you know what's what's a logical place. What what could we be looking at? It all plays in, and I think when we start talking about RIT, I think many times it's lost how what you just said fits into the whole scheme of RIT. If you do the job well, that lessens. If you're searching for the fire, the type of structure, where are we going, are we up a ladder, down a stair, you know, what does that play into the rapid intervention team as well? But, yeah, Chief, you're absolutely correct. If, if we could get that stuff squared away, that certainly would uh, reduce the uh, names on the wall. Absolutely. Well, and, and one of the things to remember, too, and, and I know we're getting closer towards the end of this, but one of the things to remember, too, and I'm seeing this in the fire service. I see it in my own firehouse. I see it all around the country. Um, I, I attended a training re very recently where I, it was a uh, personal escape system training class, and uh, a very young guy was teaching it, a guy who I have tremendous respect for, a great fireman, did a great job with it. And I was able to stand outside and just kind of take it all in. And one of the things I saw in this small volunteer company that runs 180 runs a year, and probably 90% of them are, are, you know, not exactly exciting runs, 
but what I saw was some young guys who were doing the, the interior work for the most part. And as they got out, I saw older members of the company who were maybe they're the chauffeurs, maybe they're the safety officers or some older chiefs, but they were talking to the guys. They were helping them repack their bailout kits. They, it wasn't an old versus young. And I've seen this more and more than I did in the past where I've had firefighters tell me this is a, this is a young fireman's game. This is a young guy's game. You know, old guy can't run with, with us. And maybe when I was 25, I felt the same way. I'm sure I was, you know, 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You but were. I, well, yeah, we were in class together. Yeah. <laughs> and I was still 5'8". You've never, five been, never yeah. been 10 feet tall. Yeah, I was 5'8 with a lot less gray, I can tell you, and, and a few less pounds. But the the difference that I see is this, and, and, and something we need to keep into perspective is, you need guys to be able to physically perform the duties, but you need guys who can physically understand what they're seeing, what they're doing, and why they're doing it. And with rapid intervention, that becomes an even more dynamic point of view, in my opinion, because I've been a, I've been a firefighter for all these years. A kid with five years in the job, and, and you know maybe you shouldn't put it in years. Maybe you should have put it under runs, going to fires, or going to calls. I think that's more likely because a guy who does five years in Camden, New Jersey, probably has 30 years of experience in Hamilton, New Jersey. You know, but sure. that I think that's where you have to qualify or quantify these things because we need thinking firefighters. We need thinking fire officers because rapid intervention or even just a simple a cardiac event on a fire floor requires somebody who can maintain their calm and think. Think about where we're going with this this firefighter down. Are we going back down the hose line that we came in on? Are we finding a window? Are we finding an area of refuge? And that's where a lot of this stuff can be avoided. We don't. We may not need to do every single thing that we've learned in a RIT class. Maybe just one good tactic makes all the difference in saving that guy's life. And and I I, I won't necessarily know that I end my thoughts on that, but I, I think that's where we are. I think the my last comments for this is you've got to train like it's going to happen to you because more than likely it's going to happen to somebody close to you or your or your company. There's that chance. If you're going to fires, potentially it's going to happen. And might it not be a collapse? Maybe it's just that cardiac event that we know. You know, We talk about how to save firefighters' lives and we tell them hit the salad bar instead of the wing bar. You know, The cardiac event, the guy goes down right next to you, you on the line, you on the search crew, do you know what to do? Let's start there, then let's get into the detailed riding heavy as RIT companies. Any final thoughts? I, I think that um, somebody, if you ever talk, and, and we all have, if you ever talk to somebody who's been involved with a rapid intervention incident, even a successful rapid intervention incident, to, to go with what Aaron said, it is the most emotionally and physically demanding task you will ever face on the fire ground, bar none. Uh, it will get you to your core, period. Problem is we have no way to, you know, do the Vulcan mind meld and, and tell people that. But preparing them and for your particular jurisdiction, what the possibilities are, look at the track record, look at the history, look at the interoperability between departments and recognize probably going to be on your own for a bit and have those skill sets at hand and available, um, then I think you'll be money ahead. So. Absolutely. Well, believe it or not, we're up against the hour already. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you for coming out and talking to us. And uh, I'm sure we'll be tapping you for your opinion again sometime into the future. Well, I appreciate it very much, you guys. It, it's been an honor. I'm very flattered. And uh, just a couple real quick final thoughts and overview of what we've talked about today. We're, we've been talking about RIT, um, the importance of making sure we put the fire out and a lot of our problems will go away, staffing. And uh, I feel very uh, serious that we should be staffing for the fire and staffing for RIT, not assuming that the staffing that we send to a fire can take care of both. Um, everyone should be trained. We talked about that quite a bit today, that it's not necessarily a skill set. Just a, it's, It is a specialty, but it's not a specialty that we should only train certain people on or certain companies. Everybody should be trained on RIT operations, saving their own, 
uh, the Mayday situation, all that, because we just don't know, like Aaron pointed out, we don't know when that firefighter on the line with us is going to have a heart attack. We do not know when a firefighter is going to fall through a floor or, or whatever the case may be. And we all need to be prepared. And the statistics are showing that these incidents are happening and the people are being rescued by the firefighter in front of them and the firefighter behind them, not necessarily the RIT team. It's still very important that we have the RIT team and we have that training in place and we have that those backup companies in place, um, but we all need to train. And we're, you know, hump day hangout, go figure. We're talking about training and I keep emphasizing how important it is to train. And, and my final thought is make sure if you're in an organization that runs with mutual aid departments, make sure you're talking to your neighbors. Make sure you can communicate, like Aaron pointed out, you know, doing training and the departments have different radios. They can't even talk to each other. Um, but at the end of the day, I think all three of us would agree and probably a lot of our listeners, it all goes back to training. And uh, so, again, for this first Wednesday of the month, Training Hump Day Hangout, uh, I thank you for being on. Uh, send us your questions. If you have some ideas for a future episode, we'll be back October 7th at 1 p.m. for our next training hangout. And, uh, again, thank you to Penwell Fire Engineering, Bobby Halton, and the entire staff for the opportunity to let us come here and talk to you for a few minutes. So, till next time, thank you. See ya.